la vérité touche au réel. Young Zizekians have assembled. We have a very special guest. We have a special guest with us. Brian Becker, Dr. Tom McGowan himself, the inimitable Russell Spriglia, Isabel Millar, engaging in conscious. In the imaginary domain, we have an intersubjective dialectic. Vanishing mediators. Hello, everybody. It is us again, the Vanishing Mediators, aka Andrew, uh, Big Signorelli, and Nick Castellucci, Free Beer Tomorrow. We have a special guest with us today uh, in regards to Seminar 3 and other stuff, uh, Dr. Leon Brenner, uh, author of uh, you know Autism and the Threshold of the Subject, correct? Um, uh, was it published by Palgraves? Um, we're definitely happy to have you on, uh, excited to have our second clinician, uh, on the channel since seminar one, which was, uh, Derek Hook. So mm -hmm. Leon, uh, the floor is yours. Why don't you introduce yourself and, uh, we'll get going. <laughs> well, there, there's, there's always uh, nothing to say about yourself, right? <laughs> uh, is, is there something you'd like to, to hear or, uh. Well, I, I think it would be great because, uh, you know, to, to hear maybe your clinical background or like, um, you know, what got you into psychoanalysis in particular, if, if uh, it's not too much to ask. <laughs> I know, not at all. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of a um, classic love story. It happened uh, completely by accident. Um, so I did have interest in, in Freud when I was younger. Um, but basically, uh, my study had studies had nothing to do with psychoanalysis. Uh, so this is why I'm quite uh, well versed in uh, um, phenomenology and uh, the philosophical tradition that uh, uh, diverges from it at a certain point. And um, I was doing um, a degree in psychology alongside a degree in uh, in philosophy. And uh, what happened is uh, I. Forgot, it's a funny story. I forgot to pay tuition, and then I was uh, abroad uh, and couldn't pay remotely. So basically, I couldn't get the courses that I chose. And when I came back, I only had the opportunity to take these courses that are sort of the second round courses. These that courses that nobody wants, and one of them was about psychoanalysis. And I, well, <laughs> without any intention enrolled and, you know, uh, life changed since then. It, li we lived happily or miserably ever after. Uh, <laughs> That's a good way to put it. How I got into that, uh, into that stuff. And <laughs> since yeah, it was a long time ago. And now my life is, my life revolves psychoanalysis. I'm very passionate about it. Right, right. And it's just one of those things that you could say short circuits your enjoyment and just like once you you know read a bit of freud or uh lacan like then you're just pretty much hooked <laughs> at least like that's how it was for me you know uh, and i got into psychoanalysis from uh studying philosophy which is interesting that you mentioned uh phenomenology because what's uh really pivotal pivotal of of lacan in the early seminars is his emphasis of the phenomenological aspect of the um, Freudian experience, as he will put it, um, and the analyzant speech, um, would, would you say, like, that's what he seems to, not so much focus on phenomenology, but like where it could take us and where the it sort of fails? Mm. Yes, I, I mean, if you open um, his uh, on a question prior to any treatment of psychosis, and I think that we discussed that we might speak about psychosis a little bit today. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is the paper that uh, one might read uh, in parallel to Seminar 3 uh, that I've heard uh, your reading at the moment. Yes. Um, and in this paper, Lacan basically, um, I would say... Uh, Quotes without citation, how they say, yes, <laughs> uh, Melo Ponti. So he's he's reading Melo Ponti's phenomenology of perception, and he's, he does it line by line because Melo Ponti has an interesting critique on uh, on hallucinations and the psychiatric conception of hallucination, and Lacan sort of builds his own critique on Melo Ponti. So we see that many times, and we see him also alluding to Jean Paul Sartre. 
uh, here and there in in a let's say supportive way. Yeah. But then you also see Lacan uh, opposing the uh, existential tradition that grew out of the phenomenolo- phenomenological tradition uh, quite brutally in many places, and also very early, even in his paper on the mirror stage. Right. Because, you know, for for um, the existentialist, there is something, um, well, they are, uh, let's say, um, intellectual descendants of René Descartes, um, you know, the father of modern philosophy, in the sense that the subject is at the core of their philosophy. But... The distinction, the, the the great distinction between subjectivity and Freud psychoanalysis, and in the existentialist philosophy, is that in the latter, subjectivity is tied to one's conscious will, mm-hmm. right. consciousness, sometimes rationality. Uh, you know, uh, Sartre speaks about um, responsibility, taking hold of your life. You have to do it. You have to consciously arrive at that point. But for Freud, the subject is Mm decentered. It means that it is not consciousness that is at the core of our being. This is a quote from Freud. But it is the unconscious. And this is why for Lacan, subject means something else than what it means for the phenomenologists and the existentialists. Right. And one thing I've noticed, too, because he does reference uh, Merleau-Ponty a lot in um, Seminar 2. In fact, I think in one of the lectures, it's a response to uh, a lecture that was given by uh, Merleau-Ponty himself on, uh, was it philosophy and psychoanalysis, to which he thinks that they're on the same uh, project because they aim at understanding and uh, new humanism. But Lacan disagrees because I think if I'm not mistaken, for phenomenology, as you put it, these thinkers are rooted in the Cartesian subject. But for phenomenology, there's the the cogito, uh, one that aims at a constitutive freedom and even a facticity of one's authenticity, especially since they're also uh, in dialogue with Heidegger and Husserl. And this is something that Lacan is like, no, uh, this is not what psychoanalysis is about because uh, Freud's discovery of uh, the death drive uh, cannot make psychoanalysis uh, humanism. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I, that's quite a, quite a, a a nice way to put it, Andrew. Um, I, I'll just say I hope we're not completely uh, scaring the listeners by speaking about philosophy. <laughs> but if we are, why let's do it. Let's take a few more steps here. Um, because you know the, the phenomenologists, they, they have, uh, of course, they, they they are in this sense descendants of of the Cartesian moment, uh, but also have to do a lot with uh, with the philosophy of Immanuel Kant. And there's a certain idea that you can also see in Kant, and this is the fact that our reality, that the the, the reality that we live in. Um, is established um, in direct relationship to the subject and and it, its um, confines. Let's say for uh, Kant, it was these uh, categories of pure reason and the intuitions and the pure intuitions. And the phenomenologists, they develop these. This is the mode of being that uh, Heidegger speaks about. And Merleau-Ponty speaks about, and, and it's a very interesting philosophy in Merleau-Ponty. I think it's so valuable. Uh, he speaks about the flesh. It's a very interesting concept in Merleau-Ponty and the idea that the body itself is involved in the creation of our reality, uh, our objective reality. This is the point. It is not a subjective reality that he speaks about. It's not something that is purely mine, that is, uh, let's say, relative. He speaks about the world that we share, the objective world. The body takes part in its constitution. So there is a certain logic in the world that is not um, utterly alien to our own placement within it. And, well, Lacan would agree. But for him, this logic is a linguistic logic. So it is not a question of embodiment or the question of corporeality. It is the question of the signifier, the defiles of the signifier, the way that the signifier 
forces the the instinct to uh, what is the exact word uh, is used in the translation i don't i don't remember it's something like scooch uh back into this small en- entry uh which is uh, the entry through the signifier yes and that's and one thing that it's interesting about merlu ponti because i've read uh, a, a bit of him and it seems that he does shift his philosophy around from the time that he was working on um you know, his initial text, which was Phenomenology of Perception, which um, seems to be his primacy uh, in that lecture that was given. And for him, it's like he's aiming at a philosophy of consciousness. But then, as you pointed out, uh, his concept of the flesh comes about, I think, in a, was it uh, Visible and the Invisible, where Lacan draws heavily on this in Seminar 11 with his notion of the gaze, correct? Mm-hmm. And that there's like, rather than like it's the world that gazes back at you, there is a sort of field of representation that does gaze back, but it would be his concept of But I bring this up because this is where his, he does bring something about like there is a fundamental split from our experience and the objective world, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, Psychoanalysis, uh, uh, I think, in 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 terms of its ethics, does not aim to objectify the world. Yeah, yeah? Um, and I think there's a certain modesty here, and may, people might be surprised when I say this word modesty in conjunction with the name Lacan. Yes, <laughs> but there's a certain modesty to to his teaching in the sense that he says it quite uh, explicitly psychoanalysis is not the discourse of all discourses it is not uh, well he says uh, there is no meta discourse or he says there is no other of the other he means there is no way of speaking that explains everything and psychoanalysis does not not an exception here so in this sense what what's let's say, physicists, neuroscientists might call the objective world is something that's a bit alien to what we speak about when we speak about psychoanalysis. Uh, Reality for us is psychic reality. When we say, uh, you know, because many practitioners, uh, and I've heard you might be interested in pursuing something like that, so... I can I can give you a warning in, in in the outset that many practitioners learn how to adapt one to reality. I guess this is the lion's share of of the work that is done with in this context. It is the idea that someone somehow has touch with uh, has gotten in touch with objective reality and they know what it should be, and they teach whoever comes to see them to adapt themselves to it. Uh, but for Lacan, for Lacan's psychoanalysis, there is no such thing. There is a thing that we call subjective rectification, which means, let's say, situating one in relation to their reality. But this does not mean that we uh, teach them what reality is. We just get to a point, and this is very early on in the in the in the treatment, where one has to acknowledge that. It is not only the world that is to blame. We, with our fantasies, with our dispositions and ideas, we create the horrible world that we live in. So I would say this is where objectivity in in terms of reality stops. It then turns into what you said, objectality in the question of object A and the question of the cause, but this is a completely different question than what uh, other practitioners are asking themselves when they think about objectivity. Yeah, I think uh, what you just said about objectivity and what is the inexistence of the objective world for psychoanalysis, meaning unlike many other sciences, it isn't simply assumed as having any sort of, uh, I think you put it this way, um, like a knowledge independent 
kind of existence. So if we constitute mm -hmm. our our world through the creation of libidinal objects, how can the psychotic's unique relationship to quote unquote objective reality and um, this inability to uh, maybe we could say like libidinalize objects in the way that mm -hmm. the neurotic does. How can that sort of maybe also shed light on what you're talking about right now with this, you know, impossibility of a purely objective reality? Yes. You know, you know what, uh, what is a hobby of mine is to um, uh, give uh, sometimes answers that um, that don't aim at their object, and I'll and I'll do I'll do exactly that here. Hopefully, it will be an interesting answer hmm? uh, because we're raising the topic of psychosis, and I think this will be a lot of what we speak about today. And then, you know one of the uh, classic examples of psychosis that we see in in cinemas is when someone comes to the psychiatrist and they ask them about objective reality they do a reality check uh, what day is it what's your name uh, what do you work what do you work at what year is it hmm? and uh, the the patient uh, is expected to answer proper answers and if they don't then they're mm, not in touch with reality and while i might say that there is something very true about this notion i think it's completely um, uh, let's say um, misinterpreted when we think about objective reality in the colloquial sense so how do how can we think about objective reality in another way in an, in a freudian way uh, we'll think about what is the world for freud well the world reality uh, is composed of objects and um, we might say that there are some objects that appear in our everyday life and some that don't uh, in my everyday in my uh, in my day to day i walked in the street and i might have noticed some things and i might have completely ignored some other things uh, there are things in my life uh, that I derive great pleasure from, and there are things that drive me crazy. Uh, these things, these objects. And this shows you that when we speak of reality and the objects that compose this reality, uh, we speak of objects that are invested, that we invest in, that we invest ourselves in. Uh, for uh, Freud, and this is sort of his more energetic notion of libido, the thing that we invest is libido, is psychic energy of some sorts, let's say, without even getting deeply into what that means. One invests libido in the objects in the world, and this is how they come to existence. Um, Andrew has mentioned my book and my interest in autism, and we might say that a very big problem for many autistic people is investing themselves in objects. And this is why for many autistic children, the world of object is quite poor. It is limited because they experience some challenges at an early age in terms of investing this energy in objects in the world. Now, Freud didn't stop here. You he were saying, yes, we invest energy, but then he was also saying, well, I can identify at least three distinct ways uh, that this type of investment works. And this is what Freud called the, um, mm, we might say, stages, uh, I'll call them modes of libidinal function. Uh, why do I call them in this way? Because... Um, it is not that one develops from one to the other and that's it. We always invest ourselves in different ways, in different objects. 
Now, what Freud named these um, modes, uh, if you the names, the first is autoerotism, the second is narcissism, and the third is object love. And object love is what is at stake in, in my answer right now. Autoerotism is many times confused as a state, as a mode where libido is only invested in oneself, as though the world doesn't exist. I think this is a very, let's say, um, bad way to read Freud, because basically this is what narcissism is about. Uh, autoerotism, if I'd have to sort of explain it in a few a few words, I'd say autoerotism is a mode of satisfaction, a mode of libidinal investment, where only the world exists and there is no self. So you might imagine, uh, imagine that uh, mode or stage taking place prior to the establishment or, or construction of the ego. It's prior to that. Uh, prior to the ego, and if you go and meet some babies, uh, you'll see that many of them uh, have not yet developed a sense of self, but still they experience satisfaction. Still there is this thing, there is this energy, there is this libido that they uh, experience. And Freud was postulating that they experience that um, as though it is invested in a world with no self. The second uh, stage that Freud talks about is narcissism. And this stage happens uh, after this, um, let's say, construct, this instance, psychic instance called the ego comes to be. And this is a mode where libido is invested in the ego, in the self. So one enjoys oneself. Finally, the last stage or the last mode is called object love. And this, Freud says, happens when the child is able to invest themselves, to invest this energy in objects, regardless of the ego, not necessarily through the ego. This is object love. The world of objects is a world invested with libido, regardless of the ego. This is the objective world. This is the furthest I would go. When, when speaking about objectivity. And what we see in psychosis, according to Freud, at a certain, this is his re regression theory of psychosis, is the, the fact that at a certain point, after um, a psychotic break, one goes through a regression from the stage of object love to the stage of narcissism, and this is uh, what Freud calls secondary narcissism. This move is kind of, um, it's a psychoanalytic move. You see it many times in the history of psychoanalysis. It's called the regression theory of, yeah, there are many of these. And this is the idea that there's a certain development between stages. And then some pathologies transpire after a regression from a progressive to a regressive state, to a previous state. So what do we see from object level two? narcissism. We don't necessarily have to abide by the developmental framework here. And as you can see, I'm somewhat opposed to it. Uh, we can just say that in psychosis, we see a reliance, uh, a focus, uh, a leaning towards narcissism rather than object love. Hmm? What does this mean? It means that the world of objects, the objective world, is destroyed. There are no objects invested with libido, regardless of the ego. These ties, these relationships, these investments, they evaporate. Freud calls it a cataclysm. And many psychotic people will tell you, I feel like the world around me is slowly uh, uh, breaking down. And it is true in some sense, because these ties, the lib these libidinal ties, are lost one after the other. Now I'll I'll finish in in I'll, I'll just ha have one more thing to add here, because you know, um, being acquainted with cases of psychosis, I'm sure uh, you two are. Uh, you might tell me, well. 
according to what you say here, to what Freud says here, a psychotic, let's say, person, we would expect that they would be completely secluded in a catatonic state in a room uh, with no access to the world. But that's not the case, right? We see cases of paranoia where uh, psychotic subjects are very much invested in the external world, right? They're, they have they they develop these very intricate theories about the way that uh, this is a classic. Uh, this is a classic kind of criminal example, but the way the radio uh, transmits signals to their brain in order to control them. I'm just inventing this. So they are very much invested in in the outer world. But and this is what I will tell you in response to this imagined response that you would give me. I would say, yes, they are, but only in as much as it has to do with themselves. So the radio is important because it sends messages to them. Uh, the way to work, the, what, the, what their colleague was saying, their colleague himself has relevance as long as he means something in relation to themselves. So you see, this is narcissism at work. And this is why narcissism or secondary narcissism is not merely a pathological mode of functioning. It, it is an attempt at rehabilitation. It is an attempt to rebuild the world via the ego. So objects in the world are invested with libido as long as the ego is this conduit that well sits there and assures uh, the, this type of investment. And this is what we see in psychosis. So what I would say, this, this is sort of the, the bottom line, that if we might say that psychotic subjects are unable uh, to achieve a relationship with the objective world, well, no, I think uh, many psychotic people know what time it is, know who they are, know what year it is most of the time. But if they have experienced this psychotic break, we might say that the world of objects invested with libido, regardless of the ego, the world of object love, this is the objective dimension that slowly and progressively starts, uh, they start losing hold onto. You know? Right. Yeah. I, I really like that explanation a lot. And thank you for clarifying uh autoerotism because i think i kind of confuse it with what narcissism is this investment into the body um one of the things i really find fascinating you break this down in the the beginning of your text was is um uh constitutive exclusion uh mm -hmm. and tied in with the negative structures like we have Renang, which is the linguistic sort of uh negativity uh repression versus and foreclosure, which is uh, fundamental for psychosis. But what I find interesting is that, so, uh, well, it's rejection, right? But it's Lacan that will call it foreclosure. How do we tie in foreclosure with then this um, sort of, uh, for the psychotic when there is still this investment in, you know, for lack of a better term, objective world? Because in Freud's essay, uh, the what is it it's the loss of reality in neurosis and psychosis he talks about a piece of reality that the psychotic holds onto similar to, to to the um the neurotic but then he'll use the term disavow which i don't think he's meaning disavow in the way it operates in perversion right mm -hmm. um so i want to know if you could clarify um you know the uh like those terms and how you see um, constitutive exclusion operate, not only in your work, but also in um, psychosis. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm just writing some stuff down. Okay. So um, let's take, take the long route. And I'll stop from time to time so we can have a discussion. Um, what is what is one way we can view uh, subjectivity? Well, we can ask the question of subjectivity uh, from the vantage point of Lacan's teaching. Because, you know, for Lacan, 
the the human being is a speaking being and this basically means that uh, lacan thinks that one of the most important things that characterize humanity is language um, you know many people thought many things uh, you know uh, i think uh, we had uh, ancient greek philosophers speaking about the zoon politikon so the human is characterized by politics uh, you know marx thought that the human is characterized by some type of economic factor and many people speak of the human being in many ways and for lacan for his psychoanalysis he says well when we speak uh, psychoanalytically the human being is a speaking being this means um that there is something about language that is essential for the existence of any person any human regardless of if they utter one word in their life so it's it's a much wider sense of language and i'll try to explain it in a let's say in um in an intuitive way uh, Lacan says something in the Mirror State paper, and also a bit earlier, uh, something that uh, many uh, uh, evolutionary psychologists would agree with. And this is the idea that um, human beings are born premature. They're born half-baked. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the, the evolutionary psychologist has many explanations for that. For instance, that um, the size of the baby's head, well, that's the biggest we can do. Uh, because bigger than that, um, it would risk the life of the mother. So basically, this is why we are born with a smaller head. We're not ready yet. Um, that's one explanation from a, an evolutionary perspective. But, you know, look at any, I don't know if you had hamsters when you grew up, or if you had uh, any type of other animals uh, that gave birth. And you see that when these um, pets, these cute animals, when they give birth, their youngsters, they already start, you know, interacting with their environment in a way. You know, they're not yet out hunting, but at least they go, they sniff around, they look at things, etc. Human babies don't work this way. Human babies are just born and without the care of someone they would die surely they don't do anything <laughs> um and lacan explains this using um terms that he borrows from a german uh, philosopher called Uxku. and he had these terms that well they work better in german well they don't work well in english uh they work in german and french so you can choose one of them uh in german there's a distinction between what is the inner inner world, the Innenwelt, and the Außen, the outer world, Außenwelt. And then there is the Umwelt. So the Umwelt is translated directly as environment in English. But that misses the mark a little bit. In French, French philosophers call it milieu. Um, so what Urkskul did is he... Say, he looked at different species of animals and he says, yes, in a way we all live in the same Außenwelt, yeah, in the same exterior world, so-called exterior world, but the world, and here he is a bit of a phenomenologist here, hmm? the world is species specific, the Umwelt, the environment. He speaks about a tick, you know, and he says, well, a tick it has specific senses. It doesn't see in three dimensions like us. It doesn't hear like us. Um, it has spe specific senses. It can sense heat. It can taste blood. It can smell a particular type of uh, excretion that happens in mammals, etc. This is its Umwelt. And he said, well, the human Umwelt is different. And what uh, what he speaks about is a certain connection between the hardwired instinctual level of the animal, which we will call the Innenwelt, and the Umwelt. And he says, look, animals in nature, they are born with this Innenwelt, with this instinctual hardwired, let's say, program that is fit for their Umwelt. Yeah. 
Ticks have specific instincts that help them survive in their particular umwelt. They don't need other instincts for, let's say, the umwelt of humans. They don't need to understand poetry, for instance. Okay, So we have a connection between the innenwelt and the umwelt in nature. Now, for Lacan, this is how he explains um, the birth of the human. He says, the baby is born with a gap, a rupture, and divide between the innenwelt and umwelt. Babies are born with instincts that help them, that help nothing, that help nothing at all with their survival in their umwelt. So we are born with this gap. And if we remain like this, well, no human will ever live to see another day. Lacan says the only way to bridge this gap is by learning something that is not instinctual. What is learning? Learning is making an inscription in the organism, let's say, that sticks around, that remains, that is not fleeting. You know, the lens of a camera without recording, it sees everything. But the recording, the inscription, is what preserves what it sees for some time. Language is the means with which we inscribe, with which we preserve something in the psyche. This is the wide way we might view language. So you see, it's not the English language. It is a mark. Whatever can make a mark in the psyche is language. Humans depend on that for their survival. Language is what suchers. So you see, it doesn't mend. It doesn't bridge. It doesn't solve this divide. This is why life is a bit hard, as as you you see, and as you you see when you work in the pra- in your practice, it is very hard for many people because language does it in a stupid way, in a way that is not complete, in a way that is not perfect. Subjectivity. Back to our first question. This will lead us forward, but I'll stop. I'll make a short pause here. Subjectivity in psychoanalysis is then the particular attitude that one takes psychically in relation to this gap. In other words, subjectivity is the ling- is the let's say the particular way one relies on language in the suturing of the innenwelt and the umwelt. This is subjectivity. Now, you've mentioned a few types of these attitudes that Freud identified. Repression, disavowal, you were saying rejection, foreclosure, that's true. These are attitudes in relation to this gap between the Innenwelt and the Umwelt. These are ways to use language, to rely on language in order to survive. So I'll make a stop, a, a, a quick stop here, and maybe we can open this up because there's much more to say, of course. Right, and that makes a lot of sense. One thing that I and and I really think that's perfect in which you mentioned how subjectivity sort of operates within this gap of the in envelop and envelop, and those three terms that you use sound very similar to uh, in Freud's scientific papers. Um, his like sort of early uh, topology of like the psi, phi, and omega. Um, mm. You know, mm. that, that's at least what was going in my mind. So one mm. thing that I'm very curious about, because I have trouble understanding um, how this operates. And I think I'm slowly getting it from one of your lectures on psychosis was that for the neurotic, right? Repression is, is the sort of uh, term attitude in which we operate in that gap of the in and Welt and Umwelt. Is it because of this traumatic moment in which we have an inscription um, that not only marks the subject, but for Lacan is like also the cause of the subject? Mm-hmm. And then how does this mode of, uh, not mode, but this concept, um, look, uh, Freud has its German term as it, Vorstellung representas. How does that op- operate in in repression? Because it's something that I'm still very um, confused about, and maybe 
not necessarily a, a clinical example, but if you could, you know, make a creative example of how you see that manifesting um, within this attitude of repression specifically. Yeah, there's a lot. I don't know if that makes sense, though. Yeah, yeah, it's a very um, informed, well-informed question. Hmm? Um, yeah, so let's engage with this um, Vorstellung Repräsentanz uh, uh, issue in Freud. Uh, in 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 relation to this, in relation to to the question that we're asking right now, right, in terms of of the uh, constitutive function of foreclosure and psychosis, because this is I I think where we we're aiming at today. So Freud Freud says Freud says something about the Vorstellung Repräsentanz. Uh, well, he he uses this notion in order to to express an uh, an idea. That today is um, common hold of many um, mathematical theories, by the way, and this is the idea that any um, domain, let's call it a semantic domain, any domain that might um, entail a knowledge that is coherent. Hmm? Uh, has to entail a, a lack, hmm? or in other words, something that is not representable from within it. This is um, basically the idea. Freud says that, well, in order for us to have a, a meaningful experience of reality, in order for representation, for psychic representation to function in a coherent way, there has to be something that does not find its place within it. And we can take it on several levels. Uh, we can take it first on the more, um, let's say, popular level, or the more level that more people are, let's say, well-informed of when they read or think about psychoanalysis, when we think about repression proper. Repression as defense, as Freud says. Um, and you know, repression is a mechanism that uh, um, sort of sifts away things uh, from our reality. And it functions, Freud describes it quite uh, clearly in his paper on repression. It's 1915, I think, where, when he published it. And he says, well, the psyche operates in such a way that, and this is what we've been speaking of in terms of object love and, and narcissism, it, it functions in such a way that whatever is represented is ideated, it becomes an idea, a notion that is perceived, is always attached to a quota of affect. So we, we called it libido just, just a few minutes ago, right? So whatever exists doesn't exist in isolation. There is no idea that exists without a certain affective investment, without a certain libidinal investment within it. And Freud says that consciousness is composed of this. When we're conscious of something, we're conscious of these ideas that are invested with affects. And what repression does is it operates prior to an idea being perceived consciously. And it sort of sees, it sort of makes sure that the quota of affect is not too much, too unpleasurable, too pleasurable. Uh, if that is the case, uh, repression operates by splitting the idea from the affect. And then we might have, let's say, a free-floating affect where we're not really sure what, what it has to do with, right? You know, many people say, oh, I feel depressed this week. I don't know why. Uh, or on the other hand, we might have people recounting events in detail, in great detail. And these are very traumatic events in their lives, but they experience no affect while describing them. So we might say that the repression operated there. And this is a very simple way to explain what Freud was saying. Uh, he was saying that in order for us to live in a reality that is not too much to handle, in order for us to live in a reality that we can wake up in the morning, go to work, go back home, uh, we have to have something excluded from it. So this is where repression operates. So this is, a, let's say, more surface level explanation that I can give you. But if we want to go back into this, you know, this more profound notion that we were describing earlier in terms of this attitude uh, this attitude towards the gap between Innenwelt and Umwelt and how language is, is taken 
taken up in order to suture it, uh, we might then go to a different notion of repression that Freud speaks about, and this is primal repression. So for Freud, there is repression that's called Verdrängung, and there is primal repression. You just add the U and an R in the beginning, Urverdrängung, and it becomes something primal. Uh, primal re repression is an outcome of Freud being quite logical with himself. He says, look, we have repression, and repression describes things in the unconscious. And then, well, other things that are not repressed are inscribed in consciousness. So repression operates on the basis of a division between these two psychic spaces. Hmm? Uh, now, Freud says, in order for repression to operate, first, there has to be a division between psychic spaces. First, something has to be inscribed in the psyche, not through repression proper, but through a mechanism that is in charge of making a distinction. Whoop, here and there. Unconscious, conscious. And this mechanism is what Freud calls primal repression. And primal repression, basically, is uh, a mechanism that stands at the, the core at, uh, of, of any type of attitude that one might take in relation to this constitutive gap. Hmm? Because primal repression, what it does is it creates a psychic manifestation of a gap. This is basically what it does. Psychic re uh, primal repression affirms a division affirms a disjunction that you know that creates a distinction between here and there but it is by itself not a third place yes there is consciousness unconscious and the place of division but the place of division is not uh, another psychic space so primary repression is the epitomization of this gap in the psyche if this gap is affirmed and a place for consciousness and the unconscious is created in this way, then repression can operate and then we see neurosis. That is neurosis because basically neurosis is a way of being in the world where some things are unconscious but still affect us in our daily life. They still find a way to affect our conscious uh, experience of our of our lives. This is the problem of neurosis. This is the problem at the core of neurosis, the fact that uh, I am not a master in my own house, that the ego is not a master in, their, in its own house. And in analysis, we make do with it. We don't solve it. No one stops being neurotic when they, when they come to analysis uh, complaining about a neurotic symptom. One makes do with it. One let's say, um, gains a certain appreciation to the specific way that this unravels for them. So this is why we say that repression is the cause of neurosis. But we have to say in the same breath that it is primal repression that enables repression proper that is, in fact, let's say, the moment, of, the moment where one steps into the skin of subjectivity. Hmm? Um, so speaking of subjectivity, I know we're like way far afield of psychosis here, but I'm very fascinated by the, the argument that you're unpacking here and um, definitely want to take advantage of your knowledge in this moment. But uh, I wanted to ask you, about this distinction between the umwelt and the innenwelt and the way it's sutured by language and how the signifier in that sense the logic of the signifier sort of takes on a life of its own you know in the forward to your book there's mention of the signifier as that which sort of erases uh, material traces in some sense mm -hmm. maybe of what of, of the referent, but mm -hmm. it, you know the referent falls out, so to speak, and then there's a kind of combinatory 
that happens with signifiers. And then my understanding of the unconscious is the way this combinatory is configured for the subject ends up defining their subjectivity. Now I'm talking about the neurotic subject Mm -hmm. whose psychic life has uh, repression as its fulcrum. Mm -hmm. What Mm -hmm. happens then when, let's say, a neurotic subject goes into analysis and the analyst intervenes within the kind of interspace of the signifier what what can you uh, can you explain nick what, what do you mean by this intervene intervention that i can give you a problem the, yeah they like the i mean analysis itself is a sort of intervention in, into speech as as i mm-hmm. understand it and mm-hmm. un and repression into the unconscious the workings of the unconscious the way the unconscious reasons mm-hmm. um, in a way that doesn't reflect the logic of our conscious understanding mm-hmm. of the world, our imaginary understanding of the world. Yes. How does analysis, I guess to simplify the question, how does analysis in this sense work on speech? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I hope that makes sense. Yes. Okay, so um, let let's just let's just make something. Let's put something on the table. Let's put our cards on the table um, uh, at the get go by saying that we're now going to speak about neurosis, about the neurotic subject, and. Something that's important to sort of keep in mind, keep in your pocket uh, when you read Lacan, is that in many places where Lacan doesn't specifically refer to psychosis uh, or perversion in his teaching, he would, in this sense, refer to neurosis. So he develops these uh, schemas, these uh, formulations, these ideas, and many of them. correspond or let's say represent uh, his teaching on neurosis and this is because we can say in a way that the neurotic subject is the subject of the signifier in the full sense of the of the word Mm -hmm. Uh, the neurotic subject um, relies on the signifier uh, you know up to up to the last day he holds on to it and never lets go. And, well, we have these formulations um, that Lacan, for instance, gives uh, that uh, the signifier represents the subject to another signifier. And this is, you know, it's it's quite oracular. It's a bit aporistic, um, but it, it has a lot of sense to it when we think uh, about your question. So let's think about it. Um, let's think about this moment of uh, of taking up language in the full sense, in the sense of taking up the signifier fully. Hmm? Um, what do we see? We see, um, let's say, in this again, I'll, I'll try and be a, a bit more intuitive um, when speaking now about a baby. Hmm? So a baby uh, is born into the world and the baby has some needs, some instinctual needs, hunger, for instance. This is something that uh, one experiences uh, quite a lot in their lives. I have friends that I know I shouldn't call them if it's before lunchtime, yeah, because it won't be nice. It won't be pleasant. Yeah, So I wait after lunch because hunger is a very, is a very serious thing and you know these people they're quite uh, mature adults and uh, sometimes when i call them they even tell me look i'm hungry so i'm probably going to be on edge uh, so they can in a way mediate it they can explain it to themselves and in that way sort of handle it hmm? uh, in english i think in american english you say hangry right someone is hangry this is a, a fact of life i think that that language 
sort of situates in a very precise way. Um, so think about the baby being hungry. It is uh, quite an quite an experience, and it's an experience of the whole body. It's the whole world that is hungry at that point. And we said that the baby cannot uh, get on his feet, go to the fridge, and have a sandwich. It's impossible. Uh, the baby completely relies on the caretaker. Now, caretakers. Uh, they might, you know, count the hours that passed since the last meal, but if the baby won't tell them that they're hungry, they, they won't know. The baby has to signal something to the other in order to be fed. And we might say in a very intuitive way, in a very sort of, this is an illustration right now, uh, that the baby at that point cries. This cry is exactly that first step into language. That first step into language in the sense that something of the instinctual dimension, the inenvelt, is addressed towards an outer place in the environment, in the umwelt. But it is not addressed directly. It is not telepathy. It is addressed through language, through an utterance. And this is the cry. I cry, and the other might hear it. And this is a very complex story, but let's remain on the bottom level. There is a certain intention, we might say, a certain disposition, a certain, let's say, uh, instinctual, um, worldly experience of hunger. And we might say that it is then addressed to the other through language. Now let's take a few more, take a few steps to the future where one, let's say, even utter something that's a bit more complex, and then we go back to the baby. So one might say the sentence, I am hungry, right? So when one says that sentence, one has a certain intention to express something, and it has to do with this experience, yeah? And one starts speaking. So one starts taking up different signifiers. Signifiers are, for Lacan, bits of sound, like a, i, u. They compose a language. At a certain point, uh, Lacan says that he thinks that it's enough to have four signifiers in order to have a language. So basically, Lacan said that we can have a, i, u, and t, and that's it. And we can build a whole language. We can build different words from it. He, he sort of ventures to argue. He sort of bets. But language has many more signifiers. But look, in this sentence, I am hungry. I am chaining up signifiers one after the other, right? I am hungry. And when I finish the sentence, it is only then that something about me is expressed to you, but also to myself. Now, let me give you a different example that might be a bit more interesting. I'll, I'll say the following sentence and I'll chain the signifiers slowly. And you tell me, what I mean to say. What is my intention? So let's start. Look. What could I be meaning right now? If I just say the word look, what could it mean? Directing our attention to present state of affairs. Look there. Look, yeah. look over there, right? There are many more possibilities here. I continue. Look out. Be careful, what? something's coming. Yeah. Be careful. Now it changes. Something's coming, right? Yeah. Look out for. Addressing for something or an other or an event. Exactly. Look out for your team. Support your team. <laughs> now I'll say the last word. Look out for your teammate. Hmm. So you see, I finished the sentence here and many associations sort of coming to mind. And they're very different than the associations where, which we all had when I just uttered the word look. Hmm? So this shows you that while the signifier is chained in this sequential way, one after the other, the meaning of the sentence, what I sort of supposedly was intending to say it only unravels when the sentence is complete. And when the sentence is complete, the first word, the first signifier, gains its actual meaning. 
as I was saying the sentence, these first signifiers, they kept on changing their context, their meaning. And only when I finished saying the sentence did the first word mean anything. And you learn something about me. Hmm? So let's go back to this more simple sentence that I said. I am hungry. I could mean many things. What does it mean? Basically nothing. I am also quite abstract. Many autistic uh, people that I speak with have a hard time with these kind of articulations because they don't refer to anything. Mm -hmm. uh, I am a hungry man. Mm -hmm. So now I finish the sentence. And what happens in the end? Think about this in two trajectories. And here I follow Lacan's first graph of desire. Mm -hmm. But we can sort of think about this more intuitively. This is the chain of signifiers. I am hungry. It goes in this way. It has a directional way. It's sequential. It's, it's like time. It starts at point one and finishes at point ten. But meaning and signification works retroactively. Because I first have an intention to convey. And I start conveying it. But only when I finish the sentence does my intention mean something about me. And what it means about me is that I'm a hungry man. And this basically, well, it says something about a certain conception of myself, but it says barely says anything about me. So whatever I want to express to you before saying I'm a hungry man, well, it was reduced tenfold, a million, a millionfold at the moment that I finished the sentence. Not only for you, because when I say, even when I tell you, look out for your teammate, you might think about something completely different than one, what I'm thinking about. Am I thinking about a soccer game? Am I thinking about American football? Am I thinking about another type of team activity? You don't know. You imagine it in your mind. You fill in the gaps. Same thing goes for I am hungry. It basically doesn't say a lot about myself. But I exist there in the end for me and for you as a hungry man. This type of existence is an existence as a subject that is represented by a signifier to another signifier. You see, this is not subjectivity in, let's say, in, in the way that the existentialists speak about it, in its most authentic, essentialist, uh, inherent way. This is not the subject that we speak about in psychoanalysis. It is the subject. That is the product of language. It is the subject that only comes into being when I take language in order to express something. So I was saying that, look out for your teammate. I was telling you that I'm a hungry man. We go back to the baby that cries, that simply makes an utterance using signifiers that the other might recognize. Ah, e. this is a cry. This is addressed to another. And at the end of this utterance, the baby exists as something, maybe not yet a hungry man, maybe uh, maybe as something uh, quite more more basic, but it is something that is a product of language. So the subject is a product of language, and this is how it works in neurosis. The neurotic subject is utterly under, let's say. The neurotic subject inhabits language to a full extent. There is no corner, there is no tiny um, corner, tiny tail of the neurotic subject that escapes uh, this hold. The neurotic subject uh, is this subject that is the product of language that Lacan calls the split subject. Because the signifier, it represents the subject to another signifier, but only in a partial way. Something slips. Something does not succumb to language fully. And this is why uh, no type of explanation would put a stop to the afflictions of the unconscious on the neurotic subject. This is why psychoanalysis is not an intellectual process. It's not a process of rationalization. It's not a process about, let's say, learning about yourself. Knowledge will not save you, not this kind of knowledge. 
there is an interesting quote from a very uh, recent interview with Zizek, and he was saying, uh, I'm going to paraphrase, psychoanalysis is not about getting to know yourself. Psychoanalysis is about getting a glimpse at this horrific, it's at the horrific obscenity that it is, in order to separate yourself from it, to take a distance. <clears throat> now, what is, and getting back to your question then, what is the intervention, the analytic intervention in cases of neurosis, in cases of these subjects that are subjects of language, subjects represented by one signifier to another? Uh, well, there are many types of interventions. There are many, many types of interventions, of course. We, we can we can spend a full seminar. I actually taught a whole seminar about that uh, this year. Um, hopefully, uh, you have you had Derek with you recently, so hopefully we'll, um, we're going to do something together about that very soon, and we'll invite you to personally to to join us. Um, but let's say if I, if I need to give it a general name, or if I have to describe it in a general way, um, it would be interventions that uh, bestow a certain familiarity with this division on the subject. Uh, and I'm saying here a familiarity, because I don't mean knowledge in the academic sense. Because you can learn about the unconscious in university. You can open a book and learn about the unconscious. But whatever knowledge you gain by uh, learning about it in this way is not the knowledge that I'm speaking about in terms of familiarity. Familiarity is is more immediate type of knowledge. It is, it is something that happens through an encounter. And it might surprise you that for Lacan, uh, this encounter, this familiarity with un the unconscious happens on the level of the body. So it happens on the level of the, on a level on which one identifies this division in a bodily way. And when I say body here, and when I say bodily way, well, I take us back to the question of libido. So one experiences this familiarity on a libidinal level, on a libidinal level. And through that, one gains a knowledge. But it is not a knowledge about the unconscious, right? It is the knowledge of, that we can say is a familiarity with the unconscious. And this familiarity, and this is what Zizek was describing, and, you know, as this logical moment, as this moment in analysis when one sort of faces something quite terrible, as Zizek says. It's sometimes funny and terrible as well. Depends. Uh, another mm, question asked in psycho in in, a, in an analysis is how to deploy this knowledge in your life, right? So if you would ask me, what is the course of the interventions that my, one might take in, in in neurosis? It would be these interventions that render a familiarity with. Uh, with the with the unconscious, with the inherent division of the subject, uh, bringing the subject to a, 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 a gain a certain type of knowledge that then is deployed in one's life, not in a scholarly way, but in a practical way. What to do with it? It it is a knowledge of doing. So I would say that. Analysis uh, in cases of neurosis goes something like that. So what, with your example that you gave us of look out for your teammate and the way that, you know, you gave one word at a time, there was this pause. It, it, it's very, um, it, it kind of reminds me of like the sort of pressurized time that we see in logical time in which like, that's funny because you started with look, we have the moment of the look in, in the logical time essay. but the importance of that there is a, a, a temporal time of the subject. And in giving us the example of the graph, not only is there a evolution or, or, or a linear movement, but there's also that nitroglycite aspect of mm -hmm. concluding 
oneself as the subject. And even Lacan in a seminar, he evokes the registers in speech. And he talks about, you know, look at the symbolic aspect of speech. We have the signifier, symbolic order. Um, in the imaginary aspect, it's where meaning is, is um, affirmed. We, uh, we have this uh, meaning and understanding. And then he mentions evolution and time as the real of speech. Um, so that's what that kind of like made me think and just kind of formulating these ideas. Um, I know we're, we're almost out of time, but I think maybe uh, to kind of tie this in with not only what you've elaborated on neurosis, but also psychosis, because this is something that uh, not only Lacan talks about in seminar three, but also in one. And it's something that Nick and I are, 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 are very fascinated on. And we still struggle with this is um, Verneinung. And so why it's important, um, how not only this, you know, um, infamous example of I had a dream about a woman, but it's not my mother, but also how Wolf, uh, Wolfman has this moment of Verneinung in the hallucination. And even uh, this example of Ernest Chris, this patient of uh, fresh brains. Mm -hmm. but what, what, is, what is so important about this and why does Lacan uh, contrast it from psychosis? Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> and you're right, we, we, we only have uh, about 15 minutes, uh, but you know, uh, we can always schedule another talk. Uh, it depends on the, how much fun we had. And I guess it's a question of your listeners if they find this useful. So we can always talk about that and schedule. I'd love to, to see you again, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but then, yes, so let's start with the question of negation and get back to, um, to repression and then into psychosis. And maybe, maybe we'll end on that note. So leave people a bit curious, maybe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, negation, uh, you can read all about it in Freud's paper, Negation. Uh, it's the best place to, to learn about Freud's um, uh, approach to, to this particular uh, linguistic operator. And as you gave the example, he, he gave, gives this example of an analysis and that, and this happens many times uh, in different forms, an analysis that recounts a dream and unprovoked, without Freud asking, says, oh, this woman in my dream, it's not my mother. And Freud says, oh, look, the fact that he expressed that negation without provocation is a sign that, well, there was something that had to be negated linguistically there. And this is why he says uh, negation then is a sign that there might be a repression operating there at that moment in the dream. He, he is not saying that the dream is about the mother. This is more of a party trick than what happens in psychoanalysis. It is the idea that when one uses negation unprovoked in this way, without the analyst even asking one question about that topic, one then says, mm, maybe there is repression at stake. And this is why Freud says that negation is the hallmark of repression. This is why neurotic subjects negate a lot in their speech in the clinic. You hear them saying that a lot. Uh, yes, I had that dream, but it's not what's important. The other dream is important. Mm. Um, yes, this person, mm, he, he looks familiar, but, uh, but, but definitely it's not uh, someone has to do, it's not my ex or... Uh, you know, okay, so we pay attention to these things as sort of guides, hints uh, to the idea that the repression operates there. And the analyst then, well, uh, emphasizes, punctuates, marks um, these moments, these places in different ways. There are different ways to do it in order to, let's say, get one working uh, uh, in a psychoanalytic way. Um, so this is this this is negation. Negation is the hallmark of repression, and indeed, in the speech of psychotic subjects, you won't hear negation so much. Not in the same sense that you would in the speech of neurotic subjects. Uh, psychotic subjects usually speak uh, while being quite certain of what they say. There's never a questioning. There's never a doubt. Am I right? Am I wrong? What do you think? 
It is always a fact that is conveyed, uh, an exploration, uh, an idea developed, uh, you know, and it doesn't need, uh, you know, and people think about psychosis as something that's sort of wild and delusional. It doesn't need to be, um, you know, about, uh, you know, alien from outer space. It it can be a very interesting and um, valid theoretical construction that one poses, but it is posed not from a place of doubt, but from a place of certainty. So we don't see negation in psychosis. Now, if we go back to the previous definition that I gave you for the subject, the subject is represented by a signifier. The signifier represents a subject to another signifier. And I said that an erotic subject is a subject that fully inhabits this place of signifiers, fully inhabits language. Um, the split subject in the sense of neurosis is utterly in, encapsulated in the chain of signification between the first and the last signifier. We might say that this psychotic subject, due to foreclosure, and that might be the subject of our next talk, I guess, uh, due to what Lacan calls foreclusion, or foreclosure, and what Freud calls rejection or disavowal in some cases, the subject is not fully affected by language. Um, not in the sense that I said earlier that language misses the mark, that some language always misses something, that there has to be something outside of a, of a field, of a coherent domain. In the sense that we might say that the psychotic subject is caught up between you know, some sets of signifiers. But there are points in this um, chain where the subject is not caught up in such a tight way. It is a bit loose. And particularly, and here we get into some other let's say, algebraic notations that have to do with Lacan's teaching. And I was speaking about the graph of desire. And, you know, as you, as you, as you said, uh, Andrew, there's a chain of signification that is uh, more diachronic. It, it has this time that I said from 1 to 10. Uh, and we might mark the first signifier on one side and the last signifier on the other. Now, when we think about the chain of signifiers, or let's say language as a huge chain of signifiers, a question that's a bit philosophical is, well, what's the first signifier? We talked about this with the cry, right? We refer to this. We say, what's the first one? Because signifiers, they only convey something about the subject in relation to one another, right? A signifier represents the subject to another signifier. So it's not that the signifier alone can represent the subject. We must have at least two. Hmm? So there is a first and a second. The first is a bit nonsensical. It means nothing in isolation. Hmm? This is a signifier that Lacan calls S1, or the master signifier. Or we might call it a signifier that is different. It is primal. This is how it is called in seminar three. Hmm? primal signifier and well this signifier this primal signifier Lacan says has to be inscribed not in consciousness in our conscious discourse it is inscribed in the unconscious this is in a way what happens in primal repression a primal signifier designates the first division the first distinction between itself and who knows Whatever signifiers come after, we call binary signifiers because they're different, but in their function, they're similar. They are knowledge as we know it. But the primal signifier is not knowledge. It is nonsense. In neurosis, the primal signifier is inscribed in the unconscious, is affirmed, as Lacan says in Seminar 3, through Beyahung, he speaks about Freud. We'll talk about this next time. Hmm? Uh, but the primal signifier is affirmed in the unconscious. 
and in this sense establishes a chain of signification, it can always refer back to it. We can get into more complex mathematical linguistic theories next time if you want, but we can keep it at that. Because it's first, because it is, it is there first and it is nonsensical, every other signifier in the chain of signification can have some reference to it. It is what started it all. So it's very important. And in neurosis, it is inscribed in the unconscious. In psychosis, due to foreclosure, and this is, again, what we'll cover next time, this signifier is foreclosed, is annihilated, is destroyed. It is not there. Now, this does not mean that there is no chain of signifiers. Psychotic subjects rely on signifiers. They learn, they use the signifier, they, they are represented by the signifier. But in psychosis, there is no initial primal signifier that contextualizes the whole symbolic chain. So again, I'll, I'll just say it briefly today. This means that um, the world for psychotic subjects is meaningful, is composed of signifiers as well, but it is composed of islands of meaning. So these bunch, these groups of signifiers that the psychotic picks up, learns, Psychotic people are intelligent people. They see how things operate in the world and they pick it up. They mimic it. They take it on themselves and they use it in order to survive, in order to exist in a meaningful world. They find ways. They're very resourceful in doing that. But what is, let's say, lacking or foreclosed in psychosis is this first primal contextualizing signifier that renders the whole of the symbolic order as a coherent system, as a coherent, um, let's say, universal system, as a, a system where something can have meaning that is relevant for everyone without me knowing exactly what it is. In psychosis, this is different. So we might say, yes, the psychotic is a subject of language represented by a signifier to another signifier. But again, and I'm making a little wager here, and we'll finish with that, that these are binary signifiers that are we are speaking about. And what is lacking in psychosis is exactly this first primal signifier that has been foreclosed. Yeah, that was that was that was amazing. Thank you for that clarification, and thank you for uh, your time coming on here. We appreciate it. It cleared up a lot of stuff, and um, especially with the way language operates, especially in psychosis, and how there is full of meaning. Because that's something that was really bizarre for myself to understand, especially when we're dealing with how language operates in a neurotic. And now we're talking about psychosis. But again, thank you for your time. It was definitely awesome, Chad. Yeah, it was awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Would love to pick up the thread some other time um, and talk more about your work. I know we, uh, we we skipped over that and would love to, you know, connect it with autism, the rim, all of these other concepts. But, uh, you know, if you're willing to come back on, we can pick up where we left off. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. And yeah, I'd love to to meet you guys again. So keep in touch, and and we'll schedule that. And let me know how how it went uh, with your audience. Hopefully, they'll find it very useful as well. Oh yes, definitely. Uh, most of the people that watch our channel and even comment uh, learn a lot, and they're there for the learning experience. Because again, Lacan is a difficult thinker to understand, but when you dive into the text, yes, yeah. you know. So they're watching yeah. us learn and, <laughs> and watching us fail and yeah. fail better. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, you must learn, study Lacan in a group. And yeah. this is how, uh, how he devised it uh, in his system of the cartel in a way where you we're doing it right now. Although a cartel is minimum three, maximum four. So you're mm. two. So ah, that's a problem. It's yeah. one to one imaginary ratio. <laughs> we need to bring on someone else. So precisely, precisely. All Good. Right. Okay. So we'll be in touch. And yes. Thanks for inviting me to speak yes. with you. Yes, it was it was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Leah.
Until soon. Yes. Okay.